Welcome to Regional Arts Australia's conversation series. My name is Mary Jane Warfield and I am the Regional Arts Fund Manager for Regional Arts Australia. I'm joining you today from Apantua Alice Springs. I'm on Aranda Country. Regional Arts Australia acknowledges the traditional custodians of land throughout Australia and we pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. I'm delighted to welcome you to the seventh in our series of conversations for Artlands, shaping local cultural identity. Now, all of the Artlands programming is supported by the Australian government's regional arts fund. I'd like to take a short moment today to acknowledge that a lot of the country is in lockdown right now and Regional Arts Australia's thoughts go out to all of the artists and communities that are currently affected. RIA. RAA hopes everyone can stay safe as we collectively continue to navigate the ongoing challenges of COVID regionally, nationally and internationally. So firstly, with the session, a little housekeeping. Today's session will be Auslan interpreted. As you can see, we've got David on the screen and closed captioning is available. If you wish to enlarge the view of the Auslan interpreters, scroll over the top right hand of their video panel and there'll be a drop down menu where you can click pin video. This will make that presenter screen larger. There are two Auslan interpreters today, David and Shavoy. They will interpret for about 15 minutes each and then they'll swap over. So you'll need to pin each interpreter as we go. Uh, down the bottom of your screen, if you scroll over, you'll see a chat icon and a Q&A icon. So we ask you to please say hello in the chat and use the chat to tell us where you're tuning in from and your name and yeah, your name and location. And the Q&A is for questions for the panel. So just to repeat that, put your questions for the panel in the Q&A and chat is for hello. And we welcome your questions throughout the session and you'll be able to see other people's questions and you can upvote which questions you'd like to see answered. Um, we will have some time at the end to explore the questions, but we might not get to all of them. As I said before, today's topic is shaping local cultural identity, and our session partner is Performing Arts Connections Australia. Today's panellists are Felicity Green, Stephen Henderson and Ari Pilani. The conversation will be, will be facilitated by Catherine O'Connor, who is the Executive Director of Performing Arts Connections Australia. Performing Arts Centres have an important role to play in shaping local cultural identity. The spaces they hold are places of innovation, learning and connection. They influence the economic and social vitality of a town. They sustain future practice both locally and at a national level. When programming is responsive to and reflective of place and people, it strengthens social cohesion and creates a sense of community pride. As we as a country grapple with the long-term effects of the pandemic, we look at how venues, small and large, are working collectively with their community to create opportunity for artists and audiences alike. Uh, more information about all of our speakers is available on our website today, as well as information about the rest of the conversations. So I'll now hand over to Catherine, who's going to facilitate the conversation and further introduce the panellists. Thank you, Catherine. Thanks so much, MJ. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm joining this session today from the lands of the Wajak Noongar Budja, and I pay my respects to the elders and to all First Nations people joining the session today. I also acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands upon which we are all joining from today. So thank you to Regional Arts Australia for inviting us to present this conversation. 2021 continues to morph and change in terms of COVID, uh, but this week and the last few weeks have seen a whole new waves of upheaval with new lockdowns. So thank you for being here and thank you to all our speakers when I'm sure there's much going on within your own organisations right now. Today we have Stephen Henderson from Bendigo, Felicity Green from Alice Springs and Ari Pilani from Labuat in southeast Queensland. Uh, we're here today to talk about the role of performing arts centres in shaping the cultural identity of their community and how performing arts centres engage with artists locally and more broadly across Australia, how performing arts centres can also be considered a place of innovation and learning and connection or as a networking hub for local communities and creative communities. So we've come a long way from those conversations that performing arts centres are simply the bricks and mortar that are run by venue managers who are responsible for a facility. Uh, that's a conversation that morphed 20 years ago. Performing arts centres really are the primary presenters of touring and local performing arts activity. They are also arts organisations in their own right, run by highly skilled artistic administrators and curators. So you probably hear the word performing arts centres and presenters used interchangeably today. 
At PAC Australia, we are the national association representing presenters around the country. We run a biannual survey of our performing arts centres every two years. And at the last report, and this is pre-COVID, our members were presenting over 64,000 performances to over 12 million audiences every year. And these are just uh, from what we'd call metropolitan and regional centres. So it wouldn't include the larger performing arts centres like QPAC and Sydney Opera House, Arts Centre Melbourne, um, those large capital city centres. So the reach of these regional and metropolitan venues are, are really significant. 64,000 events, 12 million audiences. And these are also the organisations who program the work that comes into their community. Uh, it might be via attending various arts markets or direct relationships with producers and artists um, and other networks that they hold. And performing arts centres really are the primary connection with audiences in Australia. We curate programs for our audiences. We then market the shows to those audiences. We sell the tickets and then we welcome those audiences into those performing arts spaces. We work with producers develop, to develop community and engagement programs. We develop our own community engagement programs. We work with artists to develop community engagement programs. Presenters are also less and less confined to delivering work within the four walls. And I use that term loosely, the four walls of a theatre. They present work in other spaces around the community and increasingly play an active curatorial role in regional festival programming as well. So performing arts centres or presenters are pretty central to the arts network or supply chain in terms of curating the cultural experiences of audiences across Australia. More and more presenters are also working directly with artists, might be producing or co-producing their work, uh, involved in creative developments or artistic residencies, and many are commissioning new work either independently or in consortia with other presenters. So one thing to know about presenters is that they are also deeply networked. Uh, there are local, state, national networks to which they all tap into. So whether that's for professional development or knowledge exchange, um, and of course, from a programming point of view, many have their finger on the pulse as to what's happening in other centres as well. So knowing that if a particular work might not be right for them, they might actually know or refer to another presenter or community whose work that might actually be perfectly suited to. So as with all things in the arts, we work best when we don't work in isolation. And I think I have to say, pardon the unfortunate pun given this particular moment in time. So presenters are deeply connected to their community, I guess is what I'm saying, and their audiences, and this is reflective in, in, in how they program. So we won't be able to have today's discussion without talking about the impacts of COVID on that programming and on those organisations. But what we will always try to bring it back to is that connection with community, is that connection with local artists and the role that performing arts centres play in shaping that cultural identity and how they sustain future practice. We'll talk a bit about how audiences are returning post COVID and how presenters are programming in response to that. Um, I was in Queensland a few weeks ago and hearing from presenters there that um, particularly in regional centres, they actually simply cannot sell enough tickets. Um, that they have shows that are selling out across the board. Um, and I think there'll be some interesting audience research that's going to come about how many of these audiences are actually new audience members, um, not simply audiences returning to the theatre. We'll talk about the backlog of work from cancelled and rescheduled performances um, and the specific ways in which our speakers today engage with their community and what they see are some of the opportunities moving forward. So I'm going to invite each speaker to talk a bit about where they're at, and then we'll move towards a broader discussion and Q&A. So to kick off, Stephen, I'm going to throw to you first, Stephen Henderson from Bendigo. Thank you. Thanks, Kat. Um, welcome, everybody. I'm coming uh, today from the, the lands of the Jajarong people, and I just wanted to firstly just pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Um, so Bendigo Venues and Events, uh, where I work, uh, is a business unit of the City of Greater Bendigo, and we, we operate a number of venues uh, in central Bendigo, including venues like the Capitol Theatre, the Alumbra Theatre, uh, studio spaces, exhibition spaces, um, and other facilities. And, and those spaces are used for a wide range of uses, uh, productions, theatre events, workshops, exhibitions, and other things. Um, but we don't just run venues, we, we produce and we promote and um, deliver various performing arts productions and festivals and 
small regional touring outside of Bendigo uh, and community arts programs generally on behalf of the city. And through this activity, we engage uh, both with our community as audience, but also as artists uh, and, and other participants in those programs. Um, performance companies from not just locally, but around our region uh, and across Victoria, Australia and internationally come to Bendigo for those, those events. Um, and and I, I suppose we see ourselves as providing these great facilities and, and programs for, for people to tell their stories and um, enable those opportunities for the community to reflect, deepen their identity and their understanding of what makes uh, Bendigo so unique. Um, and our, our program, uh, I suppose, is guided by a, a programming tool that we developed, which, which demonstrates how we can deliver uh, on behalf of the city uh, to, the, to the greater creative Bendigo strategy. And so aligning with that is really important for what we do. And, and that strategy talks about uh, engaging, welcoming, nurturing, championing, championing the arts uh, and, and, and showing off great art. Um, and we, we believe, I suppose, through our programs and our facilities that we can do that um, really well, but um, we're not relying on facilities to do that well. We, we need to, I suppose, understand uh, how things uh, happen, how, how projects need to be supported. So providing that supportive open door culture, I suppose, is, is how we can be doing that. And we readily uh, seek to support local artists through various ways, but really by partnering with others. And a, a, an example of that, uh, two, two examples really, is our, our relationship with a, a local live arts organisation called Punctum. Um, and we support their program and they're, and they're really about sort of seeding new projects and, and supporting independent artists. And then uh, we also have a, a professional working theatre company in Bendigo, Arena Theatre Company moved to Bendigo uh, in 2018. And uh, since then we've been supporting them, not just through presenting work, but also uh, helping them engage locally with the community. So it's really through uh, these sorts of initiatives that we're connecting artists and audiences and creating an environment for professional development for artists and development of new work. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about COVID. I don't want to focus on it too much, but over the past 12 to 18 months, um, we've done a lot of work to try and continue to stay connected with our audiences, uh, mainly through social media channels and online programs, um, and really trying to keep the positive messaging around what, what is happening and what we are doing rather than what's not happening. Uh, in, in 2020, we saw an opportunity for a large number of uh, Bendigo artists and performers to be on our stages uh, and in our spaces in front of a camera um, without a live audience in the room, but a, a great opportunity for everyone involved uh, to take up this sort of um, uh, opportunity and uh, the take up by our community who, who tuned in for these events was, was fantastic. Um, and and we, were, we were able to present a range of performances in local contemporary music, fine music, musical theatre, uh, and engagement with local festivals such as the Bendigo Blues and Roots Music Festival and, and youth and seniors programs as well. Um, and, and probably recognise that uh, uh, digital is part of the long-term mix. And, and we're now, I suppose, looking at how we can use digital tools um, to become more accessible and and using that content uh, to increase, I suppose, awareness and engagement with our community. Uh, we focus a lot on First Nations arts and culture, and these probably these are the areas where we sort of hope to develop more um, in future years. Is First Nations arts and culture uh, diversity of audience, children and young people is a real particular focus of, of our program. Community engagement, both support for local artists and community arts organisations, and artists that aren't currently connected to our venue. We know that there's others out there and we're hoping to make those connections and, and see how we might be able to support them. Um, so sort of building that talent pool and, and skills locally is really a key uh, opportunity, I think, for us. Um, yeah, but also disability access and inclusion. So programming um, needs to consider that. Uh, we're really linked in with uh, other citywide programs to increase uh, accessibility. Um, and just probably recognizing that um, as a venue and as, as programmers, we're really responsible for, with everyone spending so much time these days, in particular in their homes and, and on their devices, uh, we're, we're bridging that gap between people's sort of everyday reality and, and the special event of attending and sharing a live experience uh, with others. And we know that the, the venues can be that conduit and 
um, the conduit too between art and audiences and trying to find ways that we can continue to be that bridge. Thank you. Thanks, Stephen. That's great. Oh, look, I think we'll we'll pick this up further in the discussion, but I'm just going to flag it now so you can have a bit of a think about it. Um, a couple other points I've picked up there that I think is uh, something good for the group to talk about later as well is that ongoing digital delivery of performance, what that might mean in terms of profiling um, artists from your community outside the community as well and what that sort of longer term impact could be. Um, and just talk about uh, outreach in terms of how you do actually connect with your local artistic community. Um, so we'll, we'll come back to those. But now I'm going to throw to Felicity from Araluan Art Centre, noting of course that uh, Alice Springs has also gone into a lockdown today. So um, feeling that uh, your presence here today is even more um we're even more grateful for that because i'm sure you've got a lot of things that you need to be looking at so welcome to the city uh it'd be great to hear what's been happening in alice springs thanks catherine it's lovely to be here yes it has been a very strange day um, i started with a radio program at 7 30 telling everybody about what's happening in alice springs uh, over the next week and it would appear that very little will happen now. Um, so I'd like to acknowledge um, that I'm speaking from Mbantua, Aranda country, and pay my respects to elders present and past to begin with. Um, Araluan is in the heart of Australia. We, we sit on 17 hectares of native bush. We have four visual arts galleries. We've got a 500 um, Prosecco March theatre, 500 seat theatre, and we also have a central craft, two museums, no, three new, three museums. Um, and that's an extraordinary facility, really. It was, it was actually the community who 40 years ago decided they wanted to have a state-of-the-art theatre. So, you know, the federal government built it and it is wonderful. It's a favoured touring venue for lots and lots of um, people like Bangara Sydney Dance Company where we are somewhat struggling in terms of our distance from places. So we, I have a very good relationship with um, the Darwin Entertainment Centre up in Darwin. So if we're wanting to tour people, you know, major, major companies, we're often working with them. We also have, in, we engage with the community in lots of ways. We've got a, a, a resident guts dance company who, that we have a dance studio, they use that. And at the moment we've got dancers from all over the country actually wanting to um, rehearse, but of course we've got to go into lockdown. So yes, that's that's us. Thanks Felicity. And it's a tough equation, isn't it? Because when we're talking about people being in lockdowns, it's not just uh, affecting those states that are in a lockdown, it's the mobility of artists and companies to actually tour to those towns. I had some conversations with people in Tasmania this morning who were also, they're not in lockdown, but they can't actually get artists to their performing arts centre in order to, to deliver the program. So it's a, yeah, it's a very complicated time. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'll actually, yeah, yeah. Um, Ari, welcome to the chat. Uh, we'll throw to you now to do a bit of a, a background on where you're coming from and where you're working now. Sure thing, thank you. Uh, I'm Ari, I'm speaking from uh, Gaibal and Jarawa country, Toowoomba, where I live and work. Uh, and also my work uh, is on Yagara and Turrbal country, Brisbane. Uh, also, I had meant to be coming from a beautiful theatre background, but <laughs> with Greater Brisbane going into lockdown yesterday, uh, we're back to the usual Zoom lounge room. <laughs> background. Uh, I'm an artist, uh, I'm a director for stage and screen, I'm a facilitator in a variety of communities, but particularly for young people and in trauma-informed uh, contexts. Um, previously, I was the director of youth arts at the Empire Theatre in Toowoomba uh, for seven years, and then at the beginning of this year, uh, I've been working as the youth education and outreach producer at Le Boite Theatre in Brisbane. Uh, I'm also on the board of Regional Arts Australia, so connecting with them last year at a tremendously interesting time globally, 
uh, in the sector and also as the peak body as well. Um, I, I guess I sit at an intersection at today's discussion, I'm working inside of various venues, both regionally and in metropolitan, and being guided and embedded in communities, again, both regionally and metro. Uh, and then with my own cultural identity, uh, being the son of refugees and migrants on a country where there still is no treaty with First Nations and where sovereignty has never been ceded. Um, hearing the things that are being said, uh, and Catherine, as you were introducing um, this panel discussion, uh, it made me think that at times some of those spheres uh, that we all operate in, venue, uh, culture, identity, space, um, some of those spheres sometimes seek to minimize the definition of cultural identity to like tangible artifacts, uh, locations and objects. Um, and they wrestle with the intangible artifacts of like belief and practice um, ideas. Um, but I think from the perspective of where we're all at right now, we're refacing that challenge of it's the relationship between that hard and soft infrastructure. And that's where our investments have got to be. Um, the communities being respected as the experts of their place of the change making and place making that uh, goes on in those spheres um, amidst rolling cancellations, backlogs of work that we'll talk about. Uh, these spaces, uh, it can't just be venues defining who sees themselves reflected anymore. Uh, that conversation that you said kind of peaked 20 years ago, I have fear that we are going to return to that space because of where we're at. And that is a conversation around diversity and representation that we're all kind of being confronted with. And I think rightfully so, I hope we kind of steer this ship all into the right direction. Yeah, look, I think that's that's really great provocation for this discussion as well, because uh, you're right, the, the Performing Arts Centre has absolutely evolved but you know, change has been so heavily thrust upon us over the last, what is it, 16 months now. Um, I think COVID in particular has, has really given us the opportunity to highlight what the inequities are um, within the art sector as a whole, uh, and that there's absolutely opportunity there for performing art centres, presenters, people engaged in the touring ecology to really focus and um, uh, not lose this moment of opportunity to, to make those changes. I really had the sense that over the last four months or so, um, particularly as more venues were reopening um, and more work was being on stage, stages, it was, there was really this sense of, can we just be comfortable again for a minute? You know, can we just keep, um, go back to, the, to, to normality just for a minute because it's been so exhausting and so um, everything's just been completely decimated. We need to kind of get back up and running and then we can have these conversations. And I think that's quite a, a precarious place to be. I think, um, you know, we all have that responsibility to ensure that the momentum built last year isn't lost. Um, and that, yeah, absolutely, that when we talk about cultural identity, uh, that it's not necessarily a singular thing and a singular approach to that. Um, so I think, you know, in, particularly in the context of performing arts centres, it's the programming and the, the outreach of a performing arts centre where that comes into context, particularly in this conversation. So, yeah, I think you're absolutely right. Um, on that note, I think we will throw to a, a larger discussion um, and I think a good place to start probably is talking about um, what the future of a performing arts centre will like, look like in that context. Um, so I, I will start calling on people um, but absolutely please feel free to just jump in this is a discussion. Um, so I guess the first provocation would be uh, throughout COVID but also in terms of forward planning as well. Um, it's not to say that work hadn't happened pre-COVID, but how are your organisations responding in terms of, you know, the change that we, we sort of seek for our sector moving forward? 
you're all muted, so I'm going to ask you all to unmute. <laughs> and then we're going to start throwing to you. I, I'll just kind of like uh, give one example um, with Le Boite. So uh, we have our roundhouse theatre space and we have our uh, studio space just as a kind of operational kind of mechanics of observing and creating uh, point of view. But the we have our highway program, which is constantly uh, forging those pathways in through or even before tertiary education through tertiary out into the first few years of practicing and making mentoring um, and then presenting work, workshopping it, seeing how it like sits. Um, and our youth and education program as well, which um, the discussion around moving to digital youth and education uh, has looked at addressing those accessibility. I mean, across last year, in a discussion around accessibility and isolation, people had more options than ever before to see main stage recordings of things uh, all around the world. And it's those kind of elements that we absolutely have to keep and not lose as we kind of uh, navigate this next little bit. Um, but in response to your question, particularly, uh, Le Boite has now an artist company which has been made possible through uh, the RISE funding where we have 22 artists inside of the larger organization of the company delivering work, uh, running workshops, testing things out. Uh, they all have a full-time wage. They have an engagement for 18 months and that's um, 12 actors, 11 creatives. And it's an experiment. We have not figured it out and we are hoping to communicate all of the good stuff and the messy stuff uh, as we go through it. Um, but I mean, that's something that has been vastly different for the company from where we're at. And I think that's that's excellent in terms of, you know, there is messiness around this. And I think we all put a lot of pressure on ourselves to make sure that we um, absolutely get it right or don't do it at all. And I think there is actually a, a, a space in between um, that you shouldn't actually be letting fear of engaging in that space stop you from engaging so um all points to the blood for actually being that fearless and going out and going we might still have to figure this out but we're, we're out testing it um Stephen what does that lead to uh or what 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 sort of thoughts do you have around that in terms of your own local context you know you talk about working with local artists and how do you actually do that that particular outreach work yeah, look, I sort of I mentioned that we certainly work collaboratively with others on, on a lot of that, and we certainly um, have have partner organisations that are engaging artists directly for you know whatever reason, if it's to develop a new work or for an engagement project with schools or it's all sorts of different things. And I, I think we saw there's there's this opportunity to really localise what we were already doing um, in a lot of ways, so that there was local festivals that were already happening. There was um, uh, shows that were sort of visiting our towns and we were, you know, utilising sort of professional uh, experience and, and, and performers in, in different ways other than just presenting shows. But with that lack of touring last year and lack of sort of being able to be in a space together, then we still had local artists in our city that we're able to connect in with, you know, schools or uh, other organisations or companies in different ways. And for me, it sort of speaks to people generally will find their own way to, to celebrate what they do and, and culture generally. But it was really important for us just to sort of link in the arts with that. And, uh, you know, the use of technology is a good example is as soon as people were forced to use technology, um, they started playing games on Zoom and doing things, you know, that they'd never done before. And so we saw the potential to do that in an arts context. And I think that that's how we've, we've sort of been operating and, and trying to contemporise what we do. I think that the, the, the recognition that we can't just keep doing everything in this sort of static, outdated model, um, you've got to find new ways to engage across the board and, and that's all part of it. 
And I think there's always that that notion of um, the performing arts centre, you know, staff, whatever, will welcome you into the space as opposed to, you know, it doesn't actually always have to be the performing arts centre doing that outreach, you know, like actually that the space is for the community and that you do actually want to engage with artists and that it should be a reciprocated kind of exchange, quite literally. Um, Felicity, did you have any thoughts on that particular process in the Alice Springs context or broader? Oh, look, certainly. Um, I think with COVID and, and the, the limited um, availability of other touring shows, what happened to something wonderful, and that is I revisited the expense of our theatre and I looked at other models of being able to provide opportunities for local artists to use the theatre. I think it had been historically cost prohibitive, so people couldn't use it. So, yeah, when we could only have 115 people as a COVID full audience in a 500 seat theatre, I quartered the cost of, of, of using the venue so that it was a, still an economically viable thing. Um, local playwrights have done readings on the stage. They never would have done that before. But yeah, so, so COVID really forced a fantastic change I think, in, in the way things operate at Arrow. Yeah, there's a lot to that too, isn't there, around, you know, I think the average is 56% occupancy rates pre-COVID. So that's 44% of our year, which, you know, theatres are sitting empty. How can we actually use those spaces? doesn't have to be performance. Um, doesn't have to be main stage, open for an exactly. audience, all that sort of stuff. Yeah. 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 I'd much rather have people using the theatre than an empty one, that's for sure. And look, that's not to deny that there's not economic realities for performing arts centres as well, um, particularly in local government contexts where programming funds, for example, are going to be sucked away with other local government priorities. Um, but, yeah, it's it's actually there's so many performing arts centres who are in that space at the moment of going, we have this facility. I don't like using that word, but there you go. Um, what is the opportunity here? Just to kind yeah. of, like, add on to that moment, uh, I think since so many people have been challenged to uh, uh, look at the priority around financial and organisational viability and then like career sustainability as like a close second to that, uh, it really puts that the, these venues are actually the infrastructure of artists, audiences and administrators kind of like congregating and forging things that can help inform identity and its location. They are actually organisms as part of this ecology. And yeah, I think in the, the bigger part of what we are talking about is how do we communicate that with each other and then reflect it back to funding bodies, advocacy bodies, and kind of stir the pot as one or as a multiplicity. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I think that leads to an interesting conversation as well around that whole notion of audience or community needs and wants. Um, so steering away from programming, but actually having that conversation uh, with the, the overlap of, um, of audience. So, you know, what is that going to mean moving forward, uh, particularly out of COVID? Um, and I guess it is a programming conversation, programming and audiences being so inherently linked. Um, about how we actually, what we're actually presenting over the coming years in terms of, um, you know, we, the conversation pre-COVID was very much about relevancy and, uh, like you say, Ari, you know, are we seeing ourselves reflected um, on stage and to a large degree, a large proportion of Australians have not. Um, so how do we actually move forward in our programming in terms of responding to what audiences might need versus what they also want. Stephen, has that affected how your your approach to programming in Bendigo? Yeah, I think a, a little bit more of a focus on, I mean, I, I often reflect on in, as a large regional performing arts centre, we, we obviously have a lot of venue hire and commercial shows come through our spaces and, and that's fine. Um, that's one, pretty much one third of our business, but it's, it's one third of our business, but it's what we're known for in the community. Th those shows are really what people think of when they think of our, our centres generally, I'm not saying everybody, but that's that's got the biggest reputation. And it's trying to steer away from people in our community thinking that that's all we do. 
um, and really being much more of an important, um, uh, you know, um, a facilitator in, in cultural events generally. And, and so looking at a focus on where our, where our investment goes, um, you know, when, especially in regards to programming, but also just about sort of, you know, looking at looking outside of our, our venues as, as, as performing arts advocates and saying what else is happening, what else can we get involved with, what other sort of public events uh, and general activity throughout the Bendigo region um, can we be getting more involved in? And so that's probably where, where we're putting a lot of our thoughts at the moment into other, other things that, that happen that we may not necessarily have picked up on previously. Mm. And Aaron, can you maybe speak to that from the Empire's point of view? I know you're not actively working there anymore, but um, how that sort of your experience there overlaps with that? Yes, uh, I think uh, so with the Empire, <clears throat> as many of uh, the people kind of gathered here today uh, will know, is that there is more to uh, venues in regions than just, you know, quick outreach, uh, bits and bobs that are flying and fly out. Uh, and it's about this consistent, long form, self-determined uh, agent relationships within communities that really transform bricks and mortar into experience. Um, and like, for me, that's where I think legacy kind of actually sits. It's the way that communities feel towards uh, their relationship to a place. Um, and the empire, I mean, while we, the Empire has a beautiful proscenium arch theatre that has capacity for 1,500 people and lots of beautiful things happen there. But I would say some of the even more beautiful things were what would occur in uh, English as an additional language classrooms at one of our high schools. Uh, Toowoomba is a, a rival point for um, certain visa holders, uh, unaccompanied uh, minors and uh, women and children. And particularly we have um, the Yazidi community here who have arrived in a very kind of vulnerable state. And the empire got to play a really exciting part in how we come together as a community. We're speaking in multiple languages. We're dancing together. We're making spaces on our stages and off our stages to uh, just be and see a, a, the greater diversity of Australia reflected. Um, so, I mean, that's, for me, <laughs> that's kind of just as important as the big showstoppers. Absolutely. I think it comes back to that notion of performing arts centres being more than just the theatre and it's more than just, you know, ancillary spaces. It's also the relationships that you hold and how you leverage the facility um, and your role in the community. Uh, and that makes the, sense to... Sorry, please go. No, sorry. Uh, and those things uh, have to work together. They, uh, you know, we uh, there is priority around those things, but potentially it's about how we bring them into alignment so that everyone can kind of, those priorities can work together uh, rather than what shuts down first when the purse strings need to be pulled tighter. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's a really good point. Um, Felicity. Yeah, we, look, I think I've just been through um, at my first Beanie Festival at, at Araluan and, that was an extraordinary experience. Um, we, you know, luckily it happened last weekend, but we had 5,000 people through the galleries. We had to limit the number of people in. We had, um, there, there were, you know, functions on the Friday night with the whole community there, everybody wearing stupid beanies. And, um, and regard, it doesn't matter, I'm not even going to say how many thousands of dollars were spent on beanies, because that's not the point. The point was, I had a woman actually come up and burst into tears and say, you know, I've always wanted to come to the Beanie Festival and I've just had such a wonderful time. And I think, yeah, that for me is far, far, far more important than having a sellout show in the future. 
And what organisations in Alice Springs would you say that you guys are uh, working with um, in terms of developing those those programs and that that connection to community? Oh, certainly we're working with um, with Desert to we deliver um, the Desert Desert Mob exhibition every year. That's one of our really big events in September, and that's a fantastic event that really engages with all of the art centres in Central Australia. And it's again one of my favourite parts of running Araluan is is that bringing in remote community artists and celebrating um, the the beautiful work that emanates from Central Australia. So I think um, because we've, we've only got about another 10 minutes before we shift to q and I'd just like to shift the conversation back to that original provocation around digital as well, um, because we're not just talking about connection to our audiences, communities and those partnership organisations um, in, in normal sort of circumstances. There's also, you know, the development of digital throughout COVID. Um, and Stephen, I think it was your comment about the necessity to really make sure that we're still in that space moving forward. Um, it's, it's quite a large statement, but it's something that I always keep coming back to that someone actually said to me once that um, to provide digital access to performance or to you know, whatever the, the work is that you are programming um, and then take it away is akin to actually a theatre having a wheelchair ramp and then uninstalling it. Um, and that really has stuck with me. So I think moving forward, digital, we all know that it's got to be part of the conversation moving forward. There's not one way to, to do it. Um, but I'd be interested to, to hear all your thoughts around what that could look like and the way you guys are, are moving forward, um, uh, particularly in terms of what that's meant for broadening audiences, whether that's locally, um, so you're welcoming more people into, even if it's a digital space, or also uh, representing your local community much more broadly, so maybe around the country, because it's access that people have never had to your local artists before. So uh, Stephen, again, I'm going to throw to you first on that one. Yeah, I, I mean, it's a massive uh, topic and it's really yeah. um, complex. But well, I think, <laughs> yeah, exactly. I think that there's there's several ways to look at it, and and as long as you're keeping all of those uh, those different aspects kind of at the front of your thinking, then that's the that's the way to go forward for performing arts centres in particular, because um, there's this engagement potential that you, you talked about, where you can go outside of your region and and sort of, but but not just outside of your region, you can talk to people within your region who might come to a live event um, through that engagement. Um, that that's particularly interesting for us. I think that um, because we had people just uh, engaging with us online last year, uh, we were able to see how we could have a conversation with them through, you know, online, social media, um, what we're doing, what we're supporting, who's coming up next week, you know, having those conversations online is a lot easier. Um, and then the other, like you said, the accessibility um, factor is is really interesting too, because I think that um, there's certainly uh, a lot of reasons why people are unable to attend a live event. And if we can provide some sort of uh, pathway to participating um, in whatever the, the activity is through digital, then that's that's what we're looking at. But I did want to, I suppose, mention one of the, the uh, not so much a hurdle, but something that we've been really um, battling with a little bit is uh, the the quality of your online and digital uh, digital activity and being not something that performing arts centers are really set up to do um, that's not their core business or hasn't been their core business in the past I th I, I believe that there's a that, that's a, a big issue for us um, as an industry uh, in terms of how how we get through that. Um, whether it's upskilling, investment, um, those sorts of things need to need to be talked about from here. Yeah, it's not a simple matter of just um, yeah pointing a camera and hitting stream. Yeah, um, and just use of technology too. I think that there's um, a lot of uh, great use of technology in, in different other, you know other other industries, and and we're we're probably just finding out about a lot of those things now and when you see it done well it's it's really inspiring but um when it's not done so well it sort of 
is the opposite. Yes, and not not all art forms actually necessarily lend themselves to digital delivery as well. Like there's some work that, you know, in a lockdown situation, just pointing a camera at a particular work and streaming it. No, sometimes you you absolutely need an, an audience to be there. So it's yeah, and all the various ways in which you could actually provide digital content. Yeah, it's, it's not a small discussion. You're right. Um, Ari, what do you think about the, the future of digital? Uh, I agree. And I think decentralizing should not be a, a risk. <laughs> you know, it shouldn't be spoken about as like a, a risky thing at board levels, at uh, any of our decision-making levels, because that decentralization is about the diversifying of people's experiences to and from where they see themselves reflected, where they could see themselves reflected. Um, yeah, I mean, there's many examples and I've been guilty of it where you just go, oh, the digital thing. Okay, well, as a theatre person and turning on a camera, I'm sure I can kind of make these things happen. But now as we've kind of uh, brushed up on our techniques and actually allocated funding and philanthropy that can specifically be dedicated to those things and kind of put digital um, into a sphere that has, we're resourcing it as a central rather than as an attachment um, has really kind of changed the game for us and actually is speaking to how we are transforming what a theatre company or a venue could look like. I mean, the Empire Theatre uh, just celebrated its 110th birthday and uh, Le Boite is 96 years young. And if those spaces need to look tr tremendously different now because they've gone through so many things, that's not taking away from um, tradition or the history and it's definitely not mission drift. It's about bringing, it's about being responsive and responsible to what we can do. Yeah, yeah, I think you're absolutely right there as well around the, you know, um, uh, who's suited to doing what in the, in the delivery of digital. I mean, you know, maybe it's performing arts centres have um, the stage and the connection to audience uh, and that's potentially where they should, that's what they're bringing to the table. Someone else brings the work, someone else brings the digital nuance to actually ask performing arts centres to deliver all of those things and to program. Um, yeah, there's there's actually a lot of opportunity there for, for deeper collaborations on a, on a really kind of logistical level as much as anything. Um, Felicity, did Alice Springs engage in any sort of digital work? Is there any connection um, to audience or to local yeah. artists? Only, well, look, we were very lucky. We could manage to keep the theatre open. So we were still having some, we were still having local performances. We were the only theatre in the world that was still able to be open. Yeah. So that kind of, this, that foray into the digital world is not some, certainly something I've thought about, but we don't just, as I say, we don't have the skill set here to do that. Um, certainly the visual arts, we put exhibitions online and that, that went very well. But in terms of performing arts, that's not something we've started to look at at this point. I suppose maybe I'm a bit of a denialist and I hope things will just get better. Oh, and look, it is um, it is one of those things that I think, again, will be progressive over time. It's not like we all need to switch the digital um, switch on. Uh, you know, I, I'm mm. that there's a lot of performing arts centres with massive technical staff shortages at the best of times, let alone adding that layer on. Um, so potentially there's that's the other space for collaboration as well is it could be a work that's presented in Alice Springs in community that's streamed elsewhere to other audiences to actually bring other audiences, uh, expose them to the, the cultural identity of Alice Springs. You know, so there's, yeah, a lot of different ways there, but a lot of work to be done as well. Um, I think we're actually heading towards our Q&A time right now. So with that, I will hand back to MJ. You sure are. Thanks, Catherine. Thanks, everyone, for your insights and different um, perspectives on 
programming and community. I've had a question come through directly to me that is about local artists. There's a few in the Q&A and we'll get to those, but this is about local content. So um, it's for all the panelists. Um, do you think that the focus on local artists that we're seeing at the moment will have a long-term impact um, in terms of how performing arts centres program into the future? I, I can jump in. I think uh, from our experience, um, yes, it will. Um, we, it wasn't just COVID. Um, I think that we were already seeing a shift uh, generally towards how do we support regional artists uh, to be able to live and work regionally. And part of that is certainly uh, investment through local government and, and therefore local performing arts centres. Um, so we, we were, I suppose, already looking for opportunities to support financially, but also with just opportunity. And, and I, I think um, that means opening your doors and, and just basically being open to uh, project ideas and being able to connect. I think, I think what performing arts centres generally maybe didn't recognise is that their industry knowledge and experience and things like that can be really helpful for local artists. And, and I've had conversations uh, across the last 12 to 18 months about something that might not happen locally in Bendigo, but a, a local artist might be able to connect in with something that's happening elsewhere through, uh, you know, networks and knowledge that we can, we can provide. So those sorts of things, I think, yeah, like I said, all, already happening to some degree, but um, it just, in, just encouraged by the fact that uh, by necessity, we were, we were doing less of the um, more national touring and things like that. Thanks, Stephen. I think there's a big. I also. Oh, sorry, no, Felicity, please, you go. That's okay. I I also think that opportunity opportunities have opened up for local artists, but I think certainly from my perspective in terms of my program, that is getting squashed and squashed and squashed, and there will be less opportunities I think down the track because there are so many performing arts organisations because they can't go over to Edinburgh, Edinburgh or other places. I think that there's a lot of pressure on me to take, take on more than we can chew, in, in fact. Yeah, I think when you put the lens of the whole sort of touring ecology over that equation, there's, there's a lot of artists who, certainly from our point of view, we program APACS, which is the National Performing Arts Exchange. Um, that there are so many more uh, artists and companies putting their hands up to present to tour nationally because they can't travel internationally anymore. And there was already a supply demand issue pre-COVID, which has only sort of been exacerbated by COVID. Um, so there will be a lot of that to sort of nut through over the, the coming years. Um, but I, I do agree with Stephen's point about performing arts centres actually playing quite a uh, they do actually have this immense knowledge of the national broader performing arts ecology. So an opportunity for working with your performing arts centre in a local context. Um, it's about creating work locally, but potentially with a view to tour nationally. So there's actually a lot of opportunity beyond just the local as well. Yeah, I wonder in in addition to that question, do you think that audiences' um, appetite is changing for local content? I know my impression in Alice Springs is that there already was quite an appetite for local content. But do you think that that's, that audience appetites have opened up for more local content? I think it, I, for me, it depends on how it's framed. Like mm -hmm. uh, it, certainly there's opportunities where um, people will come to an event because it is local and it is locally made and it's something that they can really relate to quite strongly um, but it you know in other ways I think that it's it's challenging um, to know how to present a, a, a local work in in the context of everything else that's happening um, yeah I, I suppose that what I'm trying to say is that we we need to be uh, investing in that and and promoting that as much as we do everything else um, but it's it's a it's a real kind of working together with with those local artists and those local organisations about the best opportunity to 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 stage something locally and and the audience who is the audience and working out those sorts of things. I mean, for me, we did we did a big um, outdoor event uh, in just sort of out in the park behind our our theatre space and had a lot of local participants and that's the sort of thing where 
you you get a lot of um, audience engagement locally because of that participatory element. So those sorts of projects are really great for us. Right. I think uh, uh, Felicity, as you were saying, when you kind of hit hit those capacities, and Stephen, uh, the role of the venues, I think venues are implicated in doing some of the advocacy with and for local artists, uh, mm -hmm. because oftentimes we've got the resources or we've got the sway or we've got that industry knowledge um, so that uh, there are other ways that we can increase capacities from our purview rather than just kind of programming content from street to stage kind of situation. Um, yeah, I mean, like, having local artists as like a local artist steering committee and advisory committee actually helping to drive uh the artist voice and the pathway in and out from the venue voice is um something that i kind of think is really important yeah thanks ari i'm gonna take us to another question now from jonathan llewellyn um, so Jonathan says, sometimes the pressure on performing arts venues to have money attached with attendances can be challenging, especially when entering into the digital space. So justifying budget spends, et cetera, particularly in a local government model. So his question to panelists is, what tips do you have for the best arguments of getting past these financial, uh, sorry, of getting past this common hurdle? So the financial pressure. <laughs> what... I think, yeah, for, for me, this this comes up in all sorts of different ways and discussions. And, and it, it, it really is, I, I'd consider part of my role to, to advocate really strongly for arts for art's sake. And, you know, you, you see a lot of conversation about box office and tourism and financial return and economic kind of uh, measures around any kind of type of project, but it, it, really needs to, it really needs to be argued against and it really needs to be a really strong um, push from those inside uh, art centres to say the value of this is not the financial return. Um, there's so much more to it. And, you know, in some, sometimes there is a financial return. It's just not immediately obvious. Um, so I, I think those sorts of arguments relate really strongly to online content as much as everything else. And it's also about having an eye on the horizon. You know, you know, we don't want to get left behind. We should be future proofing and rural proofing our uh, deliveries. Um, you look at New Zealand, you look at UK and rural proofing has been a concept that has been part of their policies for a very long time where something needs to be able to uh, run at its peak in a rural capacity, let alone for everyone else. So um, I think the adaption and reframing of digital's role inside of um, access and uh, visibility and as the kind of audience development strategies as well of the future. It's, it's a core part of what our delivery for the next 15 to 20 years will be. Yeah, thanks, Ari. I think from a very hardcore level as well, um, it's really easy to just sort of say uh, we all need to advocate to our, say, local government owners um, uh, that there's greater value in what we do and that we should actually be counting what counts. Um, and that doesn't include the number of bums on seats necessarily. Um, and, you know, not all of us have the budgets to then go and do the social impact studies and do all those other things. But I think um, without pivoting the conversation to... Uh, the contrary argument, which is around the economics, I think there's absolutely an argument to be made of um, what happens when that venue is no longer there for the rest of the community beyond just the, um, uh, the lack of engagement with the arts. So, uh, you know, we were hearing from venues that they were getting letters from their local cafes and their local restaurants that as soon as they reopened post COVID, mm -hmm. that whole cityscape became alive again. You know, there was people coming through cafes and businesses. And while there's an economic bad benefit to that, there's also a massive social engagement benefit to that as well. So it's not just counting what counts within our own organisation, but it's actually much broader than that as well. It's what role are you playing in the broader community 
um, and what would be missing beyond just the art if you weren't there anymore. Yeah, beautifully said, Catherine. On that note, I'm going to um, thank all our panellists on behalf of Regional Arts Australia. Thank you, Ari. Thank you, Felicity. Thank you, Stephen. And thank you, Catherine. It's been a great conversation today. And thanks to those who could join us. Um, this uh, conversation will be available online as well as our other conversations. Um, please join us next time. It's on the early in August. And we've got, sorry, it's uh, the, the next topic is fielding, uh, field guiding the erratic with artist duo, a published event, Justy Phillips and Margaret Woodward make a long-term relational artworks about shared acts of public telling, exploring chance encounter, constructed situations and shared authorship of lived experience. They work with language, ideas and publishing. So we look forward to having them online on the 4th of August. So please register for that conversation. And thanks everyone for joining us today.